In this lecture, you will learn about covariance and correlation. We've learned about a single random variable. Now we're going to talk about two or more than two random variables, and there could be a correlation between them. So let's take an example. Suppose there's a group of people, and there's a certain probability that an individual amongst them has traveled so many, let's say, thousands of air miles. And within that same group, there's the probability that an individual will have contracted cancer. Now, this probability and that probability appear to have nothing to do with each other, but for some reason they could be correlated. So maybe it is because when you're flying high in the sky, you get more exposed to ultraviolet radiation or whatever. How does one test whether these two probability, probability distributions are correlated, that is to say, have something to do with each other, or are uncorrelated. For that, we will have to calculate what is called the covariance, and related to that is the correlation. Now, there are many, many examples that one can give. They all depend upon our being able to calculate the joint probability distribution function. Calculate it or measure it by some means. So this lecture is going to be essential for statistics and for probability because it's going to tell you how things join up with each other. And before we get into this, let me say that, that if two sets of probability distributions are correlated with each other, that is to say one has something to do with the other, it does not mean that one is the cause of the other. It could be or it could not be, but the fact that the two are correlated does not imply causality. And we will see this in a very amusing example sometime from now. Let's begin by doing a quick review of two random variables and their joint probability distribution. So as you remember, we define the joint probability distribution of a random variable x and random variable y in the expected way. Suppose there's a subset of the sample space which consists of events x and another subset of the sample space that contains the events y then the probability that a particular event x happens and simultaneously event y also happens, that is to say their joint probability distribution is this over here. So p is the probability and a shorter way of writing that is the probability that x is equal to x and y is equal to y. And you can make it still shorter by having x and y over here and if you really want to get rid of all the excess letters, then simply write P of X, Y. This means exactly what's over here. Now, if one is only concerned with events X, then you sum over all events Y. So then you get the probability distribution for only the random variable X. And of course, you can take the expectation value of X in this way the expectation value of x squared will simply have x squared over here. Any function of x will have the expectation value with f of this x weighted by the probability. And we've seen all this before. Exactly the same can be done for the random variable y. In this case, we sum over all events x thereby getting the probability distribution of y alone. And of course, expectation values, average values, are calculated in exactly the same way. So there's absolutely nothing new that I'm saying over here. And just to remind you, we call px of x and py of y marginal probabilities because they derive from the joint probability distribution which is given over here. Now, of course, the expectation value of x 
is calculated only using p of x and the expectation value of y is used calculating only p of y but what if you need the expectation value of x times y which means that xy weighted by the joint probability distribution p of xy which is over here and which stands for any of these over here well then this is the obvious way of defining the average value of xy and now as i said in the introduction we want to know if x and y are independent of each other or if they have actually something to do with each other and so we define something called the covariance the covariance of two random variables x and y is defined as follows so it's the deviation of x from its average value multiplied by the deviation of y from its average value and now you take the average of this quantity so here's one quantity here's another quantity and now you take its average this is conceptually what it is but we can get a simpler formula by opening out all of these terms so obviously we're going to get x into y then x into the average of y and the average of y is a number minus the average of x which is a number times y and then finally we're going to get minus x averaged minus y averaged and so what we get is here we need now to take the average so look at this i haven't changed anything i've just multiplied this out so what we have is average of xy minus the average of x into y the random variable minus x the random variable times the number y plus these two numbers over here and now of course what we recognize is that this averaging symbol so here and here well if you take the average of this random variable y you're going to get average of y no surprise and so you're going to get minus 2 times the average of x into the average of y because of this and so you're going to get with this plus over here this quantity average of xy minus average of x into the average of y now let's see what this could conceivably have to do with independence or dependence so suppose that the joint probability of xy what we talked about over here is simply the product of the x distribution and the y distribution well in that case the average of xy is just the average of x into the average of y how do you see that well you look at this p of x over here and it's just the product of p of x into p of y that is this into that well then this summation splits up into one summation x p of x multiplied by another summation y p of y and so therefore the product of x y simply becomes x averaged into y averaged and so that exactly cancels this and that's telling you the covariance vanishes when the variables are independent and independent means that if the joint probability distribution can be written as the product of the distribution in x times the distribution in y on the other hand if the covariance of xy is not zero then the variables are dependent well there's another quantity and it's called the correlation coefficient which is called rho of xy and it's given this name obvious name correlation of xy 
It's defined as the covariance of x and y divided by their standard deviations. And we'll see later that dividing by sigma x into sigma y simply normalizes the distribution so that we can do a more accurate comparison between different distributions. Before I proceed to give you simple examples of covariance and correlation, I'm going to show some very simple properties of covariance that follow immediately from the definition of covariance. So let's look at the covariance of x with x itself. Well, then obviously you have this thing over here, x minus average of x multiplied by itself. And that's exactly what we call the variance of x. And actually, this is exactly why we would like to divide the covariance of x with x by sigma of x. Next, the covariance of x with y is the covariance of y with x. Pretty obvious, needs no comment. Next, suppose I multiply x with a. Well, then all that this does is multiply the covariance of x with y with that number a. We'll see that this is a very useful property when we come to some practical examples. Next, if instead of y over here, I put y plus z, well then, the covariance of x with this new random variable, y plus z, is simply this sum over here, covariance of x with y plus covariance of x with z. These are, of course, all formal properties. But then, what's the use of covariance? Let's come to that. What we need is a more down-to-earth, a physical understanding of covariance. So, let me take two particular random variables, x, which I'll say is 1 if event A happens, and 0 if A does not happen. And similarly, y is 1 if some event B happens, and 0 if B does not happen. So then, obviously, the average value of x will be the value of x, which is 1, if event A happens, which is, of course, the probability, P of x, of x taking the value 1, plus 0 times the probability that x is equal to 0. Well, I don't even need to write that, but I could write over here 0 into Px with x equal to 0 instead. So this is simply the probability that x takes the value 1. And of course, the average value of y is the probability that y takes the value 1. Now let's look at the covariance. Well, the covariance of x with y is xy minus average of x into average of y. The average of x we have computed, which is this, the average of y we have computed, which is this, then the covariance is the probability that x takes the value 1 and y takes the value 1. So this is the joint probability distribution from which we should subtract the probabilities for x taking the value 1 and y taking the value 1. Now, we can have different cases, and let's go over them one by one. Well, it could be that the probability that x takes the value 1 and y takes the value 1 is greater than the probability of x taking the value 1 multiplied by the probability of y taking the value 1. So then, the covariance of x with y is going to be a positive number. So you will say that x and y are positively correlated with each other. Let me put this in another way, maybe one that will make things even clearer. So suppose I take this equation and I divide both sides by this non-zero quantity, 
the probability that the random variable x takes value 1. So then I get this ratio over here being greater than what's here on the right hand side. Now you remember from our previous lectures that this is nothing but the conditional probability. So suppose that x has happened, that is to say the event A has happened, then that means x has taken the value 1. So if we know that A has happened, in other words that x has taken the value 1, then the probability that y takes the value 1, in other words that the event B happens, will be greater than if we didn't know whether A had happened or not. So the two are correlated with each other. If we know that A has happened, then B is more likely to happen. And of course, if we know that B has happened, then the probability that A happens is going to be greater than if we did not know that B had actually occurred. So, to summarize this in words, if the covariance of x with y is a positive quantity, then A is more likely to happen if B has already happened. Correspondingly, B is more likely to happen if A has already happened. And then of course we have two other obvious cases. So suppose that covariance of x and y is negative, then A is less likely to happen if B has already happened. Correspondingly, B is less likely to happen if A has already happened. And of course, if the covariance of X and Y is zero, then the probability that A happens or doesn't happen is unaffected by what happens to B. Similarly, the probability of whether B happens or doesn't happen is unaffected by what happens to A. Going from two to many random variables is actually quite easy. So suppose we look at this relation over here which I'm going to shortly prove that the average value of AX plus BY is the same as the average value of X multiplied by A plus the average value of Y multiplied by B. That's very easily shown. So the expectation value is by definition A times X because X, capital X, the random variable X takes the value X, Y takes the value Y, and so we must sum over all X's and Y's. But what is that? Well, look at this first term over here, AX into P of XY. Now note that I'm not saying that the joint probability distribution is a product of probability distributions, but I am going to sum over all y, which I can do, and this over here is going to give me, as you can guess, p of x. And this over here is going to give me p of y. And so, what we have is A times the average value of X plus B times the average value of Y. Let's now go to many random variables, in which case this gets generalized in a very obvious way. So if I have X1, X2 and all the way up till Xn, where n can be anything, all I do is I add up the average values. So average of x1 plus average of x2 plus etc etc average of xn and these are weighted by a1, a2, an. In the remainder of this lecture I'm going to give example after example where we calculate covariances for various simple random processes. Let's begin with this one. Earlier on we had considered the binomial distribution which is this thing over here. 
You'll find this in module four. And we did a rather long calculation which showed that the average value of x is simply n times p. To quickly remind you about the binomial distribution, let's go over this formula once again. So suppose there's a coin, the probability of a head is p. This coin is flipped n times and we want to know what is the probability that we will get k heads. Now, the probability of getting k heads is p into p into p k times. But of course, since the coin is being flipped n times, that means the probability of getting a tail, which is 1 minus p, must also be multiplied many times. In fact, n minus k times. Now, how many ways can you get k heads if you flip it n times? That's n choose k. And so that explains this formula, which you have already encountered here. There, in module 4, we found that the average value of x, which you calculate by taking the value of k, weighting it with the probability that x takes the value k, and then summing over all k. And that calculation yielded this. But there is a simpler way of doing this. For this, let us define n random variables. They will indicate whether we get a head or a tail. We will make a very clever choice for the ith random variable. So for example, x1 is equal to 1 if the first toss gives you a head. And it's 0 if the first toss gives you a tail. And similarly for the second toss, the third toss, and the nth toss. We'll call the probability of getting a head p. Let me take the average value of the ith random variable. Any one of them. Well, the expectation value of xi is the value taken by xi, which is 1, multiplied by the probability that you get the 1, in other words, the heads, plus 0 times the probability that you do not get a head. That's 1 minus p. And of course, that's the probability of a tail. Now, since we've chosen our random variable very cleverly to give 1 over here and 0 over here, we get p next. What we want is the average value that results from n tosses. So we want the average of x1 plus x2 plus etc. all the way up till xn. And now we proved earlier that this is just the sum of the expectation values. So you'll take p over here plus p plus all the way here. The last one will be p. And when you add up n p's, what do you get? n times p. Now this is what we had got earlier, but now we had to put in much less effort for getting the same result. I hope this convinces you how powerful this relation over here is. This example is going to be similar to the previous example in that we will use the sum of many random variables, but it's going to be a little more interesting and have a slight twist to it. Let's assume that there are 12 different kinds of insects and that the number of insects is unlimited, an infinite number. Now, we're going to take little boxes and put five insects into each little box. Of course, every type of insect is equally probable. And now we are asked the question, how many different types do you expect in each little box on the average? Common sense tells you that that number must be certainly less than five. But let's see how to find it. So, as the first step, 
let's label each insect type by the number i where i is 1 through 12 so this one would be 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 now obviously the probability that at least one insect of type i is present inside the box added to the probability that there is no insect of type i inside the box those have to add up to one okay so let's call the first probability p and the second probability we can calculate let's say that there is no insect of the third kind this one over here well what is the probability that this will not be there it will be 11 over 12 times 11 over 12 five times and so the probability p of at least one insect being present which is p plus 11 over 12 to the power 5 all this must add up to 1 which gives p is equal to this now just like we did earlier we will define a random variable xi which is 1 if the ith type of insect is present and it's 0 if the ith type of insect is not present in that case the expectation value of each of the x's will be 1 times p plus 0 times 1 minus p and again that's because of the way that we've defined this random variable over here it's 1 if the ith type of insect is present otherwise 0 and so of course that adds up to p now what we want is this expectation value x1 plus x2 all the way up till x12 the average of that is the sum of the averages as we proved earlier and now that means that since all of these are exactly the same well then we just multiply by 12 and so we multiply 12 into p which is equal to this and now you can simplify and uh, if you work it out just convert it to decimal form that's indeed less than five so on the average you're going to get 4.233 different kinds of insects in a little box now i'm going to take two random variables and calculate the joint probability distribution and from that get many different quantities that will illustrate the use of covariance and of correlation and of other concepts so imagine that we have three flies two mosquitoes and three bees now suppose that two insects escape from this jar which has a total of eight insects three plus two plus three all have the same chances of escaping let's assume that so initially we had three flies two mosquitoes let's define two random variables one random variable is x which is the number of flies that have escaped and the second random variable is y which is the number of mosquitoes that have escaped our first task is to find the probability that x number of flies escape and y number of mosquitoes escape now there are only a few possibilities so let's enumerate them you could have no fly and no mosquito and of course that means that two bees would have escaped you could have no fly and one mosquito etc etc and you could have two flies and no mosquito in this case of course no bee would escape so then we need to calculate the probabilities of these six events for example we want the probability that zero flies and two mosquitoes escape well this sort of problem we have done many times over in our previous lectures 
I will simply write down the answer and explain how I got it. So the probability that X number of flies escape and Y number of mosquitoes escape is uh, what you have over here. Now let me explain this step by step. First of all, 8 choose 2 is the number of ways by which you can choose any two insects out of a total of 8. That's 8 factorial over 2 factorial into 8 minus 2 factorial, which is 6 factorial. That's 28 ways in which we can choose any two insects out of 8. And so we must divide by that over here. The other factors in the numerator are easily explained. 3 choose x is the number of ways by which you can choose x flies out of 3. And of course there are just 3 flies over here. Next, there's 2 choose y, that's the number of ways for choosing y mosquitoes out of the 2 present over here. And then how many bees are left over? Obviously, since only two insects escape, that number is 2 minus x minus y. And there are three bees, and so we have three choose this. So what we have over here is the probability that x flies escape, y mosquitoes escape, and of course, 2 minus x minus y bees escape. Now obviously the number of bees cannot be negative and so this number over here 2 minus x minus y has got to be between 0 and 2. So it can only be 0, 1 or 2. That means x plus y must be less than or equal to 2. Now let's make a little table so that we can actually get numerical values for all the probabilities. If you take x equal to 0, y equal to 0, you get 3 over 28. x equal to 1, y equals 0, that's 9 over 28. And if we take x equal to 2, so 2 flies escape and 0 of all the others escape, well that probability is 3 over 28. And of course we have these three zeros over here. Why? Because it's pretty obvious that if uh, two flies escape, then uh, no mosquito can escape. And of course, if one fly escapes, you cannot have two mosquitoes escaping, and so there's a zero over here. That means we've got P of XY for all the values that we want. Well, the first thing to do is to see if all the probabilities actually add up to one. And they do, because if you just take the sum 3 over 28 plus 9 over 28 plus 3 over 28 and then this and then this then all of these over here add up to 1 as they should. Next I'm going to compute the marginal probability distributions in the following way. So suppose I sum over all mosquitoes that have escaped from 0 to 2 well then that will give me the probability that x flies escape. So the sum over y, now if you take all this over here and you simply sum over all possible values of y, then you get all the values for this probability distribution. So the probability that no fly escapes is this. The probability that one fly escapes is this and the probability that two flies escape is this. Do all these marginal probability distributions add up to 1? Yes, because 5 over 14 is 10 over 28, so 10 plus 15 is 25, plus 3 is 28, so it's 28 over 28, which is 1. Now, let us look at the other marginal probability distribution in which we are only concerned about the number of escaping mosquitoes and so we sum over the number of escaping flies. So that 
is sum over x of p of x y that's the probability that y mosquitoes will escape and then again we get these numbers zero mosquitoes escaping is 15 over 28 one mosquito escaping is 12 over 28 and two mosquitoes escaping is 1 over 28 here we do see that all the probabilities add up to 1 so 15 plus 12 which is 27 plus 1 which is 28 so this also passes the test because we know p of x y for all values of x and y we are in a position to work out conditional probabilities as well remember that the probability of x given y is written this way and by definition as we had encountered earlier this is the joint probability distribution of finding x and y divided by the probability of finding y in other words suppose that y mosquitoes have escaped what is the probability that x flies will escape let's work out the various possibilities okay so suppose that one mosquito has escaped the probability that no fly escapes then is 3 over 14 which comes from here divided by py of 1 which we calculated just a little while ago as being 6 over 14 and so that's 1 over 2 next the probability that one fly escapes given that one mosquito has already escaped well that's going to be this over here this 3 over 14 divided as before by 6 over 14 and that's also half and obviously this over here is zero because you can't have three insects escaping the condition is that just two have escaped now we'll compute another conditional probability but with the condition that one fly has escaped in which case we will have p of 0 1 which is 9 over 28 divided by the probability p x of 1 which we have computed to be 15 over 28 so work that out that's 3 over 5 next we go on to p of 1 1 now p of 1 1 is 3 over 14 as before however we now divide by 15 over 28 and that works out to 2 over 5 now note over here that these add up to 1 just like these add up to 1 and then again we have p of 2 1 being 0 now here's something which is rather interesting the probability of one fly escaping given that one mosquito has already escaped is not equal to the probability of one mosquito escaping given that one fly has escaped so in other words the condition matters so for example p of x equals 0 y equals 1 is half but p of y equals 0 x equals 1 is three-fifths let's go on and ask if this joint probability distribution is independent in other words can it be shown that p of x and y breaks up in this way something that depends only upon x something that depends only upon y and of course if it's to hold it should hold for every value of x and y not for some particular value but for every possible value of x and y actually the answer for that is pretty obvious so let's look at for example p of x equals 0 y equals 0 that from here is 3 over 28 which we calculated of course from here on the other hand if I take p of x equals 0 and p of y equals 0 well that we saw was this over here was 5 over 14 and this was 15 over 28 uh, let's uh, now adjust it 
so that it's something times 3 over 28. So this is 50 over 28. What's absolutely clear is that this is not equal to this. And now finally, let's compute the quantity that we defined at the very beginning, the covariance and the correlation, and see what that works out for the probability distribution that we've calculated over here. Okay, so we're going to now go to the next step. I'm just repeating the values that we have calculated earlier. So px of 0, px of 1, of 2. So from here you can calculate the expectation value of x. That is just 3 over 4. Actually that's very simple to see because this would be multiplied by 0, this would be multiplied by 1, and this would be multiplied by 2. So 15 plus 6, which is 21, divided by 28, and that's 3 over 4. If you calculate the expectation value of x squared, well, just take a piece of paper and figure it out. It's 27 over 28. So you would weight this with 0, weight this with 1, and weight this with 2 squared, which is 4. From this and this, we calculate the variance to be 45 over 112. Let's repeat this for mosquitoes. So the probability that zero mosquitoes escape is 15 over 28, one escapes is this, two escape is this, and we can again calculate the expectation value of the number of mosquitoes escaping, which is 2 over 4. Of y squared, it is 4 over 7. And if you calculate the variance of y, that's 4 over 7 minus 2 over 4 squared, that's 9 over 28. Next step, we want to calculate the average value of xy, which is x into y, weighted by the probability distribution p of xy, which is here and which is on this table over here. So just take a piece of paper and a pencil, and this works out to 3 over 14. So then the covariance which is this minus variance of x into variance of y, that works out to negative 9 over 56. And now from this, we just work out the correlation of x and y. For this, we divide the covariance of x with y by the standard deviation in x, standard deviation in y, and I remind you that sigma x squared is equal to this, and sigma y squared is this. So once you just uh, simplify, this works out to minus 1 over square root of 5. So of course the covariance is negative and the correlation is negative because that's just dividing by some positive number. The real question now is, what does this negative sign over here mean? Now you remember that when I talked about x and y being positively correlated, that means that if y increases, x increases. On the other hand, if there's negative correlation, like over here, that means if y increases, x decreases, and correspondingly, if x increases, y decreases. Can we understand this in terms of mosquitoes and flies? Sure. So, since the number of insects that are escaping from the jar is fixed at 2, therefore, if more flies escape, then fewer mosquitoes can escape. Correspondingly, if more mosquitoes escape, then fewer flies can escape. And so they are negatively correlated with each other. Now, of course, just to make things simple and obvious to everyone, I just used 
three flies and two mosquitoes and three bees, but I could have used 3,000 over here and 9 million over here and uh, 10,000 over here. The numbers don't matter. It's just that the, what you have over here will become more complicated and more messy. The point is that in this case where the number of insects that are escaping is fixed, there is a negative correlation between two different types of insects that have escaped.